Brownsville Cheese Base 2012 Legislative Forum. Project 100% and Ozzy Loza Productions for doing our audio and video recording and sound. We'd also like to take a moment to thank our vendors here this evening. We have Antonio's Restaurant, Lori's Tortas, Juani's Cakes, and Bogo Magazine. Thank you very much for your participation. And now I give you our moderators. Thank you so much for that. Again, the same rules will apply to the congressional candidates as we had with the state reps. We ask you in the audience to formulate some questions that you might have and we'll apply them to the question and answer session. Thank you so much for coming out and giving us your time to inform the public, obviously an important part of the process as we get ready to head to the polls. We'll start with a two minute introduction and we're gonna begin with Elmo Icock. Sure. Thank you, you Brownsville Cheese May, for hosting this event this evening and supporting democracy. We appreciate it. And thank you for having me here tonight. It's an honor. My name is Elmo M. Acock, and I'm a candidate for Congress. What I've seen here in the Valley, in the Lower Regrand Valley, in what is now the 34th Congressional District, is the lack of a common vision, a common grand vision. A grand vision that gives us all a voice. I hear your voice. I've heard your voice this whole campaign. I'm going to take your voice. This old Marine is going to aggressively take your voice and amplify it. And they're not just going to hear it in, in, in Austin, in Washington, D.C., but they're going to hear it around the world, from here, around the world. And this is what they're going to hear. They're going to hear that we're created, we've, we've created a world-class education system that graduates its students at a high rate, that are college-ready, and finish college. And when they finish college, they're going to come right back down here and help contribute to our society down here. And the way they're going to come down, the reason they're going to come back is because we're going to create jobs and opportunities for them. The way we're going to do it is I'm going to aggressively go up to Washington, D.C., aggressively bring back our hard-earned tax dollars that you worked hard for. Bring them back down here to develop our communities here, develop our infrastructure for us. I didn't say Develop our infrastructure, develop our communities, we're going to help our businesses here that are here organically, that are from here, create, grow and, and create more jobs for us. Not put up barriers for them, but give them the tools they need so they can succeed and create more jobs, new jobs. We're going to attract outside corporations, outside manufacturing, because that's going to be the, the industry of the future for the next 10 years, manufacturing. Outside manufacturers, outside corporations to come here and create new jobs for us at real wages, so we can afford the American dream too. So we can afford the American dream. Okay, two minutes. Oh, that's it, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, vote for ACOC. Thank you so much. Up next to Della Garza. Microphone. I want to take this opportunity to thank Chisme, Linda, and group. They always do an awesome job. And I want to publicly thank Erasmo because he has fought for his community, because he has fought for his community college, and because he has continues to work for Texas Southmost College. And we know how much our community needs our community college. Thank you. I am Adela Garza. And I am one of your neighbors. I've lived in the Rio Grande Valley for 36 years. I've owned a business many businesses. My husband and I built a life in this district. Together with my children, we want a better life. I am having a little bit of trouble with what we are living for our kids 
in the future. I want to work for your family and for every family in the United States. There's no doubt in my mind that the country is facing very difficult times. Our deficits are ridiculous. Our taxes are out the roof. We have no border security. There's no jobs. And to quote Mr. Alex Dominguez, 11%. And we want to implement a, when I implement a health program that is ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ramiro? Okay, it's on now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank also the Brownsville Cheesemate Group and the panel. It's very important to have the uh, community get engaged and get us to know us as candidates. My name is Ramiro Garza, and I am running for Congress because I want to put my experience of creating new jobs and opportunities in South Texas to work for you. I uh, care deeply about South Texas because this is my home. This is where I grew up. I grew up in Port Isabel. I graduated from high school there. I also attended UTB TSC, where I received my bachelor's degree in finance. Um, just a little over a year after that, I also received my master's degree in business administration from that fine institution. I stayed here in South Texas to get my education, and I've stayed here ever since. I did all that uh, while working full time and also helping uh, my family uh, be raised, my siblings, after the sudden loss of my father. And that was very important to me for me to have done that. My experience, let me use this here, excuse me. My experience uh, includes working with communities all throughout South Texas, creating opportunities. I started working with a federal empowerment zone right here in Cameron County, helping small businesses achieve their true economic potential, from helping them start their business, helping them grow their business. I also helped the city of Port Isabel launch her first strategic plan that was a roadmap for economic growth and prosperity. All then was recruited to be the executive director of the Edinburgh Economic Development Corporation, where in that role, I helped create over 10,000 jobs for South Texas. While the rest of the country was losing jobs, I was helping create them right here in South Texas. That success led to my appointment as city manager for the city of Edinburgh, where I oversaw over 700 employees, balanced a $100 million budget, and streamlined city services to make for a more effective and efficient city government. But I've stepped down from that role as city manager because I want to run to be your next congressman. And I am fully committed to becoming and using my experience to help create jobs, expand transportation, and broaden access to higher education. And I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you for that. My name is Jessica Puente Bradshaw. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am from Brownsville. I was born in Matamoros, however, and raised in Brownsville when my mother moved here when I was four years old. I went to school in Mid-High, and uh, this is uh, where my heart is, regardless of all my travels. A little bit about me, how I have served my community, because people here need to know that I am not a career politician, and I'm not a lawyer, nothing against lawyers. Um, I have served as a teacher for middle, with middle school students, high school students, and I have also taught, helped teach adults who were immigrants English, naturalization classes, and computer classes. I moved kids from ESL into regular English classes. So even though I run as a Republican, I know what it's like to be a teacher, a public servant, and so I have nothing against those services that provide things for those children and those of us who need the help. I have also am a small business owner. I work with real estate investors who are looking to invest in communities who have dilapidated homes, who need repair in their streets, and, and want to improve the economic value in those neighborhoods where people who are hardworking individuals want to better themselves and their communities and the homes around them. I'm also a wife of 17 years, a mother of two children, and 
for many years in my life, but professionally for now three and a half years, I have been a political analyst, and I have studied the federal issues in depth. I am probably the only candidate here who can say that ha she has read the entire um, Obamacare bill. I have read cap and trade and NDAA. Those are just three of the bills that I have read and that I know a lot about. Can I close? Okay. Uh, I'm, pro I'm not your typical candidate, and I will probably say a lot of things that are not rosy and happy, but I will always speak the truth and lay things out how they are regardless of party, and uh, thank you very much. Good evening. It's an honor to be here, and thank you, Cheeseman, for putting on this debate. You know, this is democracy in action, and I'm actually really proud to be another choice for you. You can see we have some great candidates, and I'm another choice that you're going to have to listen to and learn some facts and learn more about me, and that's why I'm glad I have a two minutes to at least very quickly tell you what I'm about. My name is Denise Sines Blanchard, and I'm a product of Brownsville, Texas. I'm a born, I've been born, I was born and raised here. My father was a World War II vet and a police officer, served law enforcement in this community for over 31 years. Both my parents sometimes had to hold two jobs to be able to support two, uh, seven children on a policeman's salary. So, you know, we, we, we've had to work hard, but thank God for the values and the character that were instilled in me from very young about law and order, integrity, honesty, hard work, you know, that has helped me to get through life. And as a working mother, as a single working mother, earning my college degree. And uh, there are many times you want to give up because you just think it was just too hard. But you know, you, you have that, that resilience. You say you have to do it because it's the only insurance policy you have. But with all that hard work that uh, I have done, um, I have decided the reason I'm running, first of all, is that I am not only a mother, but I'm also a grandmother. And I am so concerned about what is coming down the pipeline for our children, what we're going to hand off to them. And what I want to do as your next Congresswoman is to work hard to create the jobs that we need, bring them back home, improve our economic development, improve our education system. We have a lot of money that's going into, into education, but we need to be able to, to arm our children with the ability to have a 21st century education of something they can use to actually have a career to help them have that career and to be able to provide for their family. We want to continue to provide services for our veterans. We need to fight for Social Security and make sure that, they, that there are certain people in Washington that keep robbing our Social Security Trust Fund. So there are many issues we need to, to work on, and going as your representative, I will fight hard for our community and all of our issues that are important to us in South Texas. Good evening. My name is Salomon Torres. I'm a proud Democrat running for Congress. I'm from La Feria, and I now live in Harlingen, Texas. I have a beautiful wife, Yvette, who's here with me, who works at the Regional Academic Health Center in Harlingen. I have three beautiful kids, four years old, and two, twin year old, two and twins, two, uh, two years old uh, girls. I have a mortgage, and a beautiful dog at home, and a suegra to boot. I'm going to tell you that I received my uh, education at La Feria High School, graduated with honors, went on to St. Edwards University in Austin, graduated, attended there through the College Assistance Migrant Program, got my master's degree from the LBJ School of Public Affairs in Austin, and then my law degree from Columbia Law School. Have 17 years of experience, both in Washington and here in the district the last 10 here on the ground doing economic development work, representing Congressman Ruben Hinojosa for the last nine, carrying out his agenda in Hidalgo County, in Cameron County, and up, and up north. The reason I'm running is because I'm a, pro I'm, I'm a very proud American. I am proud to have had the opportunities that this country gave us, our family as, as an immigrant family, and I really cannot do anything else with my life other than to give back. I'm going to serve you in the U.S. House of Representatives with the goal to expand those opportunities for people like you, people like me, who want, who want to start from the ground up. I also want to say that commitment to public service 
is something that we need to take very seriously. I, I am a big fan of government. I'm not one of those that wants to destroy government. I'm one of those that wants to make it better. That's my goal in serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to getting to know all of you as I visit with Brownsville and the rest of Cameron County. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Anthony Troiani. I'm running for the United States House of Representatives, District 34. Before I get started, I'd like to thank Brownsville Chisme, Dr. Figueroa, and Brian for being here tonight. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here with so many engaged people because this is what we need in our community. We need community civic engagement. I am a product of Brownsville. I went to Hannah High School. I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. I served in the United States Marine Corps. I went to University of Houston where uh, I paid for school with the GI Bill. And in the summers, I would load trucks in Chicago as a Teamster. I recently received the Buck endorsement. I'm very humbled and very proud. And I have a plan for our community. Over the last four years, I have been a city commissioner in Brownsville, Texas. And during that time, I had the opportunity to go up to Washington. We discussed economic development. We discussed border issues. We discussed border security. I have experience as an attorney in federal courts. We have dealt with immigration issues, criminal issues, civil litigation issues. And those were issues that allowed us to get a reversionary clause in the border wall. We're the only community between Port Isabel and San Diego to have such a clause. And I was an integral part of that, along with our negotiating team. And I, like so many other people up here, are going to talk about economic development. And there's only two types of resources, human resources and natural resources. And in this district, we have a wealth of both. We have a population that is growing, that we have to train, that we have to invest in so that we can carry them into the future. And we have the natural resources in the Eagle Ford Shale, wind, energy, biofuels, all of those things are things that we can work with in our community to get us into the future. We can talk about the past, we can talk about where we're going, but at the end of the day, we live in the future. And for that reason, I humbly ask for your vote and your support to be your next United States Congressman. Thank you. We'll now start the question and answer portion of the political forum. We're going to start with Elmo Acock first with this question, which has been, questions have been gathered from community members, from social media networks, and the like. And the first question has to do with the violence that's going on in Mexico. Obviously, violence is a constant concern for the people of the valley with our proximity to the border, whether it be people who travel across, they have family members, they work along the border, or the threat of spillover violence the violence in Mexico is a concern to many people. Some people even believe that government should classify drug cartels, drug cartel members, as terrorists. So the question for you is, how do you think we could stay ahead of this major security threat, and what role should the government play here along our border to protect us? There's two ways you could do that. There are two ways you have to do that. The United States government is going to have to go to Mexico and find the, the government faction, the government people, our government factions in Mexico that are not corrupted completely by the uh, drug cartels. When you do that, you can for, uh, form a partnership with them in, in a system and what they need with funds, leadership, or even weapons, so they can fight the drug cartels in Mexico. With the spillover violence and the drug trade here that comes to the United States you need to fund properly the local police forces and give them the tools they need to partner up with federal programs or federal, federal institutions like the Border Patrol or INS to enforce the laws here and secure our borders here. The way you do that is to go and get grants to, to, to give training, to give a technology, give equipment to local police forces like the Sheriff's Department or, or our local police department so they can team up together to provide more border security for us and even personnel. Right now, the Brownsville Police Department is a quarter percent undermanned. That's totally unacceptable. When it comes to declaring the, the drug cartels as terrorist organizations, 
that's a possibility, but you don't want to enter down a slippery slope there because once you declare them a terrorist organization, that's going to cause for the United States government to respond to terrorist organizations like we have traditionally always have with war and, and mili military actions like we have in Libya and Iraq, Afghanistan, and even uh, Lebanon and Syria. So when it comes to that, that's I support giving um, um, money and, and manpower and equipment to the local police forces to fight the drug cartels here and secure our borders here and secure our towns here and, and be a more proactive federal government, be more proactive with the, with the government in Mexico to create security there. Once you solve the security problem there, you won't have the spill of violence here. Thank you for that. Same question, Adela Garza. I think first we need to accept that we have a problem because our government keeps telling us that our borders are safer than ever. You know, we had a, a conference at, at UTV, TSE, and when Congressman uh, Poe came to talk to us, um, every law enforcement came to tell us that the borders were safe. We know that they're not because we live here. We need to work with our neighbor, Mexico. We need to help them with their violence. And we need to secure our borders. And the only way we can do that is through a bipartisan uh, bill that we can work with Democrats and Republicans and local officials and state officials because we need help. But first we need to accept that we have a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Same question, Ramiro Garza. Thank you. I've had the privilege of uh, serving with the Texas Border Coalition. It's a coalition of communities along the border from El Paso to uh, Brownsville. Um, in that, I support completely. They've recently called for funding our ports of entry. When we talk about securing our border, what I refer to is funding our ports of entry. Funding our ports of entry so that our ports of entry are well equipped with personnel, with the technology that they need, so that we can be better secure here in our community. The General Government Accountability Office estimates that uh, there is 6,000 new agents that are needed at our ports of entry, all throughout from San Diego to Brownsville, and $6 billion in funding to upgrade our facilities. Ladies and gentlemen, as your congressman, that will be my focus. We need to continue supporting these initiatives and find the resources that we need to secure our borders. That is the answer. And we need to support the efforts by these groups like Texas Border Coalition and others that are partnering with our local communities. They're also advocating for other funding for our law enforcement groups in our region that can help support any kind of spillover violence that come our way. I have gone throughout the district. I've seen some of the issues that are affecting this issue is not just affecting the border, it's affecting north of us, it's affecting some of the communities north of the checkpoints. And as, as I mentioned, as your congressman, I will work and fight hard to make sure that our ports of entry are fully funded. Thank you. Thank you for that. Same question, Jessica. Can you just repeat sure. It? Sorry, We're talking about the violence in Mexico and the concern the people of the valley, especially here in Brownsville, that they have with the proximity to that violence and the concern with spillover violence. Some people believe the government should classify the drug cartel members as terrorists for more aggressive action to prevent that spillover from happening. How do you think the government should tackle what some consider to be a major security threat? Okay. First of all, um, I do not agree with the idea of categorizing the drug cartel violence as terrorists. Um, we all know, or you know, that if we go down that route, we run the risk of having American citizens also be classified as terrorists if they have even a remote affiliation or maybe perhaps a family member who happens to, to be uh, committing illegal crimes through drug smuggling and what have you. So we don't want to go down that slope, first of all. Um, there is a problem. It is a crime. People here in the Valley are, are worried about it, whether it's bullets whizzing through the air or uh, actual cartel violence moving across the river uh, into our area. So that does need to be addressed. 
Now we have a, a tier system that we need to look at, and all of it is going to need some funding, absolutely. But we have a police force, the local police force. They are here to protect the community within the cities, uh, the localities, the sheriff's department. They need to focus with the crime that is already here. We also have the Border Patrol. They do protect our, our ports of entry. They deal with immigration issues. We need to, to make sure that they have the resources necessary, whether it's bulletproof vests, guns, uh, surveillance equipment, so that they are not only protecting us from illegal immigration or, or smuggling of individuals or um, small drug crime, but that they can protect themselves and that they are in a situation where they are not fearful of get, getting, uh, being reprimanded by the government for perhaps using a little too much force. That's the second level. The third level is the military. Now the military does scare a lot of people, but the fact of the matter is, is that the military is the only organization or the only group of the federal government that is, has the ability and the training to be able to fight uh, the cartel violence at that level. It's not the job of the police or the border patrol. We do have to have the ability of having the military here, but also within a limited basis, uh, just to ensure the say, that, the say, that the crime does not spill over. Thank you so much. <laughs> Denise, when you're ready. Okay, um, it's a very good question. In fact, uh, that issue is extremely important to me. Um, you know, coming from a law enforcement family, um, I understand and I get what's going on here. There is a lot of stuff happening that people are afraid to talk about. And one thing that, as I'm talking to many people throughout the entire district, now that our district goes all the way up to Goliad and DeWitt, you know, there is still a lot of concern about our security. Now, should we classify them as terrorists? Well, there's, you know, at, at this point, um, when we start seeing the terroristic acts, as we've been seeing in Mexico, then I'd say, I'd call that terrorism, okay? But the issue is this. The, is the issue is that, once you lose your security, you will surely lose your economy. And we must never let what is happening in Mexico ever happen here on our soil in the United States of America. And so, what, but what we need to do, though, is first of all, our military, we have a law that's called the Posse Comitatus. Military cannot enforce local laws. They cannot enforce civilian rule. But what is happening is that our local law enforcement are having to pay out of their local budgets for an international problem. And so when I go to Washington, I'm going to fight to make sure that all of our local law enforcement communities are given not the resources they need to protect the citizens. Because it is, the, under the Constitution, the responsibility of the federal government to protect its citizens from foreign threats. And we have those foreign threats. So we must make sure that we have the resources going to our law, local law enforcement, our first responders for manpower, technology, training. And those are the things that I would propose. The other thing I'm proposing is that I want to create a national hotline that when people in our communities see somebody stand in your backyard with an AK-47, you can call a, a, like a 511 number. Anyway, I will certainly fight and uh, work for border security in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. <laughs> Mr. Solomon Torres. This is a very serious matter here in the Rigandi Valley. Security has to be one of the top issues that we work on when we get elected. When I get elected to Washington, this is one of those that I will work on very closely with local law enforcement. Everybody's right about the emphasis on local law enforcement needing the technical and the personnel resources they need, whether it's bulletproof vests, new communication systems, more personnel, more vehicles, whatever they need, we should provide it to them. These folks are on the front line at the sheriff's departments, up and down the border, and up and down 77, up and down 281. Those folks are on the front line and we need to give them what they need. Same thing with local police departments. Whatever they need, we need to listen to them and work very hard to get for them. But it's also federal agencies. We have a number of federal agencies that operate in our, in our, in our community here. DEA, FBI, Secret Service, and there's others. Whatever they need, even the U.S. Attorney's offices that have to prosecute all the bad guys, they also need to be 
addressed as far as what they need to make sure we keep up with the number of prosecutions that we need to in order to keep people out of, uh, out of uh, narcotics trafficking and other criminal activities. But it's also about creating more commerce on the Mexican side. The more jobs you create on the Mexican side through more trade with the US, the more you're gonna discourage young people in Mexico to stay away from criminal activity. And this is also related to immigration reform. Folks get frustrated that they haven't been able to come to the US in legal ways. And so we need to work together to carry out immigration reform in Washington so that we provide more avenues for people who are, who are able and willing to contribute to our country in very positive ways through jobs, starting businesses. We need to work with them to come to the US through immigration reform. So it's a complicated matter, but it can be addressed if it's addressed in, 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 in a broad way like that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Our final candidate, same question, Anthony Trioni, when you're ready. To put it simply, border security starts with border prosperity. As a city commissioner, we worked with Patton Boggs to come down. Patton Boggs is a lobbying firm in Washington, and the idea was to, de to develop economic development zones across the border. When you, we live in a region, and the region includes Brownsville, Matamoros, Monterrey, McAllen, and if we look at this area and we increase the economic development of this area as a region, we are going to discourage people from being involved in other illegal activity because they're going to have the opportunity to participate in a safer, more economically and healthier way in our communities. One of the big things that we have and one of the things that we have tried to promote, at least I would promote, would be to have a Coast Guard station increase in size in South Padre Island, where you would actually have a frigate. A lot of the drugs are coming in along the Gulf Coast. We would need to have more interception. And also, we are a perfect climate for a Border Patrol training facility. We are on the border. We have a river. We have desert. We have the sea. It is a per perfect place for us to train Border Patrol officers, officers around the country. That is something that I would push for here. Border security is a huge issue for our, our area because we're also starting to see a lot of immigrants. You're starting to see people come over for investor visas, and the reason they're coming is because they want the safety and security of the United States. Well, the safety and the security of the United start States starts with a strong middle class and we need to promote things that are going to make our region healthier. Not just Brownsville, but the entire region, including northern Mexico. The economic development zones that were, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. I wanna switch away from the border and into a different issue that's also very important, um, especially down here in South Texas. Um, and if not, of course, Texas and the nation. This is uh, concerning alternative energy, and this is the question is going to be uh, the first to Adela Garza. In a recent documentary entitled Thrive, Foster and Kimberly Gamble of the Procter and Gamble namesake reveal that entrenched interests, interest groups among others, and government agencies, the Iron Triangle, if you will, uh, have been effectively suppressing alternative energy technologies from being developed and released to the world. Now, considering that Texas economy is uh, reliant on oil, this is, of course, a, a question that's very pertinent to, to, uh, uh, to Texas. What steps will you take to ensure that alternative energy technologies will not be hindered from being developed thus helping relieve our dependency on oil? Hmm. Let me see if I got your, your question. What would I do to promote new? Right, what would you do to promote alternative energy? At the same time, um, try to do something about the, the hindrance of development, the development process of these new technologies, because we have very entrenched 
interests, interest in other types of forces in Washington, among other places, that uh, you know, have, have, have hindered the process of developing new energy sources. And we're going to start with, with with our president just declined the opportunity to, to have a pipeline from our neighbors in Canada. We chose to buy oil from a dictator. But we are doing several things uh, with wind energy, and, and I think that's moving in the right direction. However, we are not being able to sustain uh, wind uh, energy without government subsidies. Our vehicles need to move with less gas. And I know there's technology. You know, our citizens are not dumb. As Americans, we're smart. We can do this. Yes, there is so many lobbying groups that suppress our entrepreneurship. I am sure there's more ways to curb the appetite for oil. I am sure we can come to a, a, a different solution. But unless we have a government that is willing, willing to fight for commerce, for entrepreneurship, and to develop new ways, Washington is broken and we need to work together. Our citizens have bright ideas. We can do this. Uh, We've got great engineers. We've got great scholars. I'm sure we can find ways, but we need to work together with our bipartisan parts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. Garza. Thank you. This is a matter that I believe has to do directly with jobs. In my opinion, I would support the promotion of alternative energy. This, uh, with the goal, support energy independence completely. I believe if you look at the northern part of our district, you have four of our counties that are affect or not affected, positively impacted with the Eagle Ford Shell project. That's a project where right now, as we speak, they're drilling three times more than they even anticipated to begin with. There is communities in those areas, those counties, that have seen an unprecedented amount of growth in their taxable value because of the drilling that's taking place. It could be done there, it could be done here in the state of Texas, it could be done in the rest of our country. In order to do that, we need to make sure that we can ensure our environmental protection agency, whenever they make a ruling, whenever they make any, uh, anything that may affect our ability to, uh, our, with energy independence, we need to ensure that it does not affect the environment, but it also does not affect the creation of jobs. And in my role, what I would support, and what I would think that we would need, it would occur to me that we would need a national energy policy. This exactly is what we would need to solve some of our limited resources. If we would grow to our energy independence in the way that our friends are doing in the north of our county, in the, uh, this District 34, we can get there. There's communities that, are, that have seen a billion dollar increase in taxable value in one year alone in one year alone. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is helping their economy. It can help for energy independence. It can mean new jobs for our area. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica? The very last part of the question, just so that it's clear again. Basically, the, the what steps last. will you take? Two part question. What, what take? Uh, what, what steps will you take to ensure that alternative energy technologies will not be hindered by these forces? Okay. Interest groups, among other forces in, in D.C. and around the, the country. Okay. I think that the answer is very simple. Uh, we have to get rid of the lobbyists from Washington and Capitol Hill, flat out. Uh, they are the ones that are pushing for or against whatever technologies that we potentially uh, can invest in. 
because of like that documentary shows is they have an interest and whether it's in gas or whether it's in alternative energy, they are going to push for that and leave the little guy out. And what I mean by the little guy is I mean the entrepreneur, the research and development, the educational facilities who are trying to create this new technology. Now, we have windmill energy, which comes from Spain. That is a, a Spanish company that the ones that come to the United States to create those jobs, the temporary jobs that eventually leave. We have the battery power, which we are investing in as Americans in Finland, and that is going nowhere when it could be invested here at home. We also had Solyndra, which was a green energy company, which was invested by the federal government. That went nowhere. It was our taxpayers' money that went into that development, and we've actually lost money on that, and now we're also bailing them out. So besides getting rid of the lobbyist organizations, one, we need to reduce taxes at the general level for these individuals or, cor or smaller corporations who are willing to develop the technology and have already developed the technology, existing technology, they just cannot fight the big lobbyists in Washington. We also have to remove the research, um, or we have to make the research and development tax credit permanent so that businesses can keep more of their money so that they can invest in better technologies than what they have now. Um, we also need to use within our district, the, we have the educational facilities. We need to go out, find the private companies, the investors who are willing to come into UT Brownsville, uh, Kingsville, Texas A&M Kingsville, and all, the, and all the, the schools and college communities and are willing to invest in the engineers, in the scientists, in the, in the technology, through these students so that they can have jobs and employment when they get out of college. Thank you. Thank you. Energy is very important to our communities and to our country, to our state. We are very fortunate in our new district, in District 34, and particularly in Texas, we have it all. We have the wind, we have the sun, we have the oil, we have the gas, we have the seawater. We have it all. And so when we talk about jobs and economic opportunity, we need to explore all options including alternative energy. And so as far as any hindrances, basically when I'm your congresswoman, I don't care who it is that comes to push their, their initiative to whatever side, the bottom, the bottom line is how does it affect the people I serve? And I will always support and vote for those things that are going to benefit the people that we serve. So alternative energy, we just, we're getting a brand new wind farm in, in Willacy County. You know, we have high unemployment in that county, but it's a godsend. But yet we also, just further north, I was just in Alice today. It's an amazing what's happening with the Eagle, the Eagle Fort Shale. They're, they have 6.5% 6, 6 unemployment when everybody else has 9%. They have no housing. They, do not, they, have their, they don't have enough roads for what is happening because of this growth and this boom. If we're ever going to also get away from the energy dependency from the Middle East, we must explore all options. We must, we must definitely explore the, continue the drilling using our natural gas because it's such, a, it's such a great price right now. We should be exploring and utilizing that and looking for every alternative. And I believe that the government should continue to offer tax incentives or tax incentives to continue this development, this R&D and the development of alternative energy. That is what's going to get this economy moving, growing, and keeping it strong. And not only that, we can also. We have the Keystone, we have the Eagle Ford Shale, and we have the Intercontinental Shelf of Oil. If we explore all those, we will never have to get oil from the Middle East, and I'm all for it. Okay, thank you. Solomon? We, the U.S. generates less than a third of its energy from these alternative sources that you reference, wind and solar. And it's, it's rather unfortunate that the U.S. just has not kept up with the other developing nations in this respect. There are Chinese companies that are eating our lunch when it comes to producing these types of alternative energy sources. And so as a congressman, we have to be very, very aggressive in challenging our local industry, challenging our small entrepreneurs in the U.S. in District 34 to enter this field with confidence. But with confidence, it means with some support, 
We need to continue supporting our local community college in Harlingen, TSTC. We need to continue supporting our university here in Brownsville, UTB, with research grants, partnership grants, with several agencies that provide grants for this type of and uh, this type of development, whether it's uh, whether it's Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, or others. We also need to, as a congressman, one of the biggest tools you have is to file legislation. And one of the pieces of legislation that I would introduce would be to work with local industry to find out what kind of tax incentives would be, would be workable with them in order to encourage those energy companies that rely on carbon and rely on oil for generating electricity, for example, that a certain percentage of their energy generation be from alternative sources such as wind energy. It's also about biofuels and biomass. In Santa Rosa, we have a sugar plant that refines sugar, as you all well know, and when it processes this material, it generates biomass, which is now producing electricity for the grid. That's right here in the Rio Grande Valley, and we could be replicating that with other materials that we haven't uh, yet developed here in the valley. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Anthony. Energy is a huge issue. We have just fought two wars, and we are dependent on foreign oil. American national security has to do with how we power our homes, schools, and workplaces. At this time, we have the capacity with the Eagle Ford Shale to possibly be energy independent. We could be one of the largest exporters of oil again. Another thing is, is that while we have this capacity, Texas will get thousands, if not millions of jobs, cluster in industries will grow up around it, and it will give us the base to launch alternative methods of energy production over the years. One of the big things that we've seen are biofuels. Uh, King's, University of Kingsville has a program to produce jet fuel, and the UTB also has its own biofuel project. Right now, we have the ability to put ourselves in a situation where we won't have to wage foreign wars for oil with the Eagle Ford Shale. One of the big questions that, or big topics that we just heard from the state reps was there's no money. There's no money for this. There's no money for that. Well, if you look at it, when President Abraham Lincoln was fighting the Civil War, he put in the first federal income tax. President Bush fought two wars and reduced taxes, and we complain about there being a hiccup in the economy. Okay? If you've got the ability to produce your own oil, if you've got the ability to have this natural resource work for you, you can use it as a platform to make yourself energy independent. And we can do that with the biofuels, the solar, and the wind. The complaint right now is that the wind generation isn't up to the same economic level as that of the natural gas and shale gas that we're getting right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Elmo, please. To answer the first part of the question, it was how would we keep intransigence in Washington from undermining our efforts to become energy independent and create um, and develop more alternative fuels and develop an integrated alternative fuel energy uh, grid. The way we do that is in your hands. You have to make sure you, you support and elect a congressman that is going to fight for you, put his foot all the way down, keep his eyes open to people that are there to undermine the process. You make the process when, you, when, you, when you're giving the grants and you're giving the money to industries and corporations that are working in alternative fuels and bio, our, our biofuels and alternative energies, you have to make sure that process when you're giving them grants and giving them support that is uh, transparent and everybody involved is known. So you can't, you can't have any, anybody there that's undermining it that you don't, you don't know about or you don't understand that's there. You have to have somebody that's there to keep their eyes open. I would have a task force in my office specifically for that purpose, making sure that when we're trying to make legislation and, and allocate funds to these corporations that there's nobody there trying to undermine it. That would be one of the main things I do. When it comes to um, 
developing energy here for ourselves, we have to make sure, first things first, that there's an educated population here to create that energy grid. UTB is heading the way. I was in the subway in, um, in, a, in a Port Isabel, and I was going through shaking everybody's hand, and I had the privilege and honor of talking to a young man that's working in that field right now, and he's studying for it at UTB. And he gave me uh, more information than I knew about the, the industry. And that's the kind of people we're going to need, and that's the kind of people we're going to need to support this industry. Congress, one of the powers of Congress is to support useful or fund useful sciences and industries. I would support the, the development of, of green energy and biofuels here in the valley and to create an integrated system here for us in the valley and use it as an example for the rest of the country. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to field some questions from the audience. Okay, the question was fielded uh, for the audience and it is in reference to commitment to uh, our veterans who uh, have served our country heroically. What would you do to help the hundreds upon thousands of veterans who suffer from depression, from PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, and many of those who have fallen into incarceration? After all, these veterans have served our, com our, our country. How, how do you plan to serve uh, those who have served us? Ramiro Garza, please. Thank you. We have an obligation to care for our veterans. I know in the last forum we talked about Veterans Hospital, and earlier y'all talked about that, but this is a very touchy issue that I'm glad you're bringing up uh, right now. You know, our veterans go, they go to war, and I know we, a lot of us talk about what are we going to do to help our veterans? What are we going to do to hold hands and make sure we are there for them as they are for us, protecting us. I will tell you that I have experience and when I worked in the Federal Empowerment Zone, one of the programs that came out of that was a Veterans Business Opportunity Center. That center was in place that we worked alongside with to help uh, veterans that wanted to start their own small business. We need to have other centers to address the issues that you just mentioned to make sure that our veterans are cared for our veterans deserve, and this is not special treatment, ladies and gentlemen. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, went to the Navy, and he would tell me about the issues that they had sometimes when they came back from war. And our, right here in the Rogan Valley in South Texas, we have, percentage-wise, a lot, very large increase compared to the rest of the country of, our, of the military that's represented by our veterans here in, in South Texas. Our veterans deserve to be treated with respect, they deserve to be treated with dignity, and I would support funding centers that would address veterans in all aspects when they come back from war. Thank you. Jessica Puente Bradshaw. Um, as far as the, vet the veterans issue goes, uh, we're talking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and, and, and many of the mental health um, and, and emotional health problems that a lot of our veterans are coming home with. First of all, we need to make sure that we address these problems much earlier. So early intervention is going to be key. Now, if that, whether that is through the, vet, the VA program or whether that is through a federally funded but privately uh, delivered care, that must be done for our veterans. Young, as well as veterans who have been back from, you know, whether it's Vietnam veterans, uh, Korean War veterans, we must address them all at every level. A veteran, whether uh, it's, it's from before or now, is just as important to everyone in the community. The next thing that we need to do is we need to provide um, a better an implementation of a program that can allow these veterans to be better integrated into the communities. Many of them feeling very useful in their service to our nation, come home to a lack of jobs, they have training that they are not able to apply in the real world service, and, and they come to an area where now they are responsible for themselves or are purchasing a home. We need to make sure that we address those issues specifically. So if that includes a program where we can help them integrate their, the skills that they learned uh, while in service, so that they can become productive members of society, which is really what they want at the end of the day. 
No one wants to serve their nation and then come home to nothing. And so I am all for veterans. Uh, I have many friends, young and old, who have served this nation and really all they want is to know that we are there behind them, that the federal government is there to help them, and they want to apply the skills that they have in their communities, and I am all for allowing that to happen. It is something that we, they deserve, and we should allow the federal government, and we need to fund for them. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Blanchard. Okay, thank you. Veterans, as I've said, has been an issue that has been so near and dear to my heart. You know, my father being a World War II veteran, all my uncles. But more important, because I didn't quite understand the veterans, not even my father, until I started working with a congressman 20 years ago, and one by one began to see the veterans come in. One particular case, it was a gentleman that, that had PTSD, but at that time in, in 1991, the government did not acknowledge PTSD. He was a teacher, couldn't keep a job because he kept beating everybody up. He had applied for his benefits in 1971, and um, no, I'm sorry, 1981, and he could not get anywhere with the VA. That was my really true, strong, my first experience with, with someone with PTSD, and from there on, it was, it was an, I can't even tell you the number of cases I worked on with these issues, and it breaks my heart. But I will tell you, after six months of working on that gentleman's case, we got him his full benefits retroactive. But then he would call me. I was all of a sudden his savior. And he would call me, but he would call me from jail. Because even though he got his benefits, sometimes he wouldn't take his medications. But you know, and I, and I couldn't help him. Because at that point, your congressman, remember there's three branches of government. We can't get involved in the judicial system. The law is the law, and nobody's above the law. And right now, there, we do need to address that issue. It was one issue that we worked, I worked with some JAGs um, to talk about that issue that we have right now. There are returning Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans that are, that are doing one, two, three, four, five t tours right now. They're not coming back the same. They're, they're, they have the PTSD, they have the depression, but they're not acknowledging it. Why? Because they don't want to, have this, the stigma, and they want to be able to come back and try to assimilate into a natural life and to get a job. And if they have that on the records, they feel that that's going to hurt them. So we, the government, did pass a bill where they're, they are getting more help, but we need to continue to do more. And more important, we need to have our local congressional offices, when our veterans cannot get help Thank you. from the VA, that they will have a representative to be there to fight for them. And I will do that. <laughs> Solomon Torres. You asked specifically about veterans with PTSD or those who have a criminal background. Yes, depression, PTSD, and those who are uh, incarcerated. I've learned from my experience with Congressman Hinojosa that a lot of times the answer is actually not with VA. A lot of times the answer is with peers, other veterans that have the same emotional or, or, or mental or behavioral challenge that they've come back with. So as a congressman, I would work with community groups that need seed money in order to create counseling groups, to create groups within universities or within employment agencies, basically offices where veterans would be comf comfortable going to. Many veterans do not use VA services because they feel that they've already have taken too much from the government and going to the VA actually takes more from the government. That, that's so. That's an indication of how proud they are about their service to the U.S. But the answer also has to be reform of VA. My name is not well liked in VA. I will tell you that. From here to Washington, we have made it very clear out of Congressman Hinojosa's office that this area of Texas, South Texas, our South Texas, is not getting an equitable share of resources from the VA. The facilities that have come up, the facilities that have come up in the last few years were forced on VA. They weren't out of the goodness of their heart. It wasn't because of real analysis. It was forced on them by the congressional delegation. That has to change. And if it means an investigation of VA to see how much they allocate to San Antonio versus how much they allocate to us, given our growing population, then that's what we have to do. 
It's also about increasing the pride, the pride among those who served. They have enough pride, but many times those who never served or those who never had veterans in their families can appreciate the challenge that they had serving. And so that means sensitizing our students, doing more community groups, group meetings with them, basically treating veterans like the heroes that they are. Thank you. Um, we'll remind the audience that applauding actually takes away from the time that the candidates have to speak but we are excited about your excitement. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Troiani. Thank you. I'm a veteran, and at the end of the day, you have to protect your veterans. One of the biggest sacrifices someone can make is to say that they're willing to die for their country. We have a volunteer force. This force is made up of students, parents, people who are working in the community, and we protect their jobs when they come back when they're reservists. One of the big problems that we have is when they come back after serving four or five tours, they're not the same. They've seen things that nobody wants to see. And we need to provide services quicker than five months. You can't show up at a VA clinic or a VA hospital with post-traumatic stress disorder in May and get an appointment in November and think you're going to be okay. You have people who are highly volatile. They have been in a situation that is extreme and their only way they know how to react is the way they've been trained to react. If they react violently or aggressively, it can't be, it's not a surprise. They're going to run into the, the legal system and they're going to be placed in jails. And unfortunately, we don't say, I'm sorry, you were just a Lance Corporal and we're gonna give you a pass after this happened. They do get incarcerated. What we need is a system that will deliver services immediately. One of the things that I would propose as a congressman for this area would be that there be a national voucher system. We don't have a hospital down here. We need to push for a hospital down here so that people don't have to drive four hours. But in the interim, and this is something that would help everyone, is if veterans had a card where they could go into any service provider and get medical treatment for health issues, mental health issues, that would be something that would solve the immediate need now. And that is something I would fight for. Thank you. Candidate Elmo Acock. I served 12 years in the United States Marine Corps. I served seven months in Iraq. We had 1st Battalion, 23rd Marine Regiment, was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, and we had bullets whizzing by our heads every day, bombs blowing up like it was nothing, rockets flying through the air. That affects a person's mind. It affects everybody's mind. Some people, it stayed with them longer. When the 1st Marine Division came home, it immediately started. People started going to jail, beating their wives, not coming to work on time, not following orders, beating their children, being reprimanded, being um, court-martialed. What happened was they weren't getting the attention they needed. They didn't have anyone to talk to. A lot of my Marines, when I was a corporal, needed someone to open up to. What a veteran needs to be able to help him cope with that mental problem, that mental anguish and pain and anxiety, what I saw, what I experienced with my friends at home that have PTSD and the Marines that I had that were in the Marine Corps at the time, that had PTSD was someone to talk to. When they had a psychologist or a therapist to talk to, that Marine completely turned back into the Marine he was before. A, 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 um, a normal, for back, lack of a better word, normal, reasonable person, not prone to being extremely violent and flying off the handle at any moment because that's one of the characteristics of PTSD. Here in the Valley, if you want to help a vet here in the valley with his PTSD, your congressman, your next congressman is going to have to push for a full service veterans hospital that's fully staffed to help that veteran with not only his mental problems but any other problems that they have. PTSD is a real threat and they need real help, a real threat to their success and a real threat to their future and they need help. I, when I came back, I was fine. We went through a lot, but I was fine. But my friends needed help. And as your congressman, I will push very hard to help them 
get someone to talk to. They need information. They don't have the information they need to go to get somebody to talk to. They need guidance. That's what I want to push for. That's what I want to fund. Thank you. Other Lagarza? Mr. Torres and I have fought this battle together. I know because I saw it firsthand. Our veterans are not believed when they say they have mental problems. I proudly served in MHMR board. The stigma that follows MHMR is horrendous. So much that we had changed the name to Tropical of Texas Behavioral Center. There's families that have fought to have a full hospital in the valley. And I know Mr. Torres and I have dealt with Mr. Treto Garza uh, and others that have had their fathers fight for a hospital. Now their kids have, are fighting for a hospital. And the problem is very, very real. When our soldiers come back from serving our country proudly, they come with mental problems. We need to have centers to help them. There's many students that are going to medical school. This is a perfect way for them to do their social service like Mexico does. We need to give back to the people that put their lives on the line for us and to defend our freedoms. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna start this one with Jessica Fuente Bradshaw. You'll be answering this one. And the question uh, deals with, obviously, a lot of people are happy to see troops in Iraq finally coming home. We know we still have troops in Afghanistan and other nations, but there isn't a day that goes by where we don't hear on the news now tensions are escalating between Israel and Iran over the threat that Iran will become a nuclear state. President Obama wants more sanctions against Iran. Israel is leaning more towards military action. The question for you is where do you stand on the issue of diplomacy on this matter versus defense? And do you think a nuclear Iran poses a direct danger to the US? I listened to the speech that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, gave recently. And uh, there's certainly a threat if if we were Israel, we would be very worried if we had a nuclear threat at our, at our backyard or our back door. Um, so uh, where do I stand on this issue? The people of Israel uh, must be supported. We have uh, claimed, we have declared our allegiance. Well, we are allies with them. Uh, I believe that as the United States, we should be prepared. We should, however, stand on the sidelines, ready to defend our allies if necessary. Um, I do not believe that we should aggravate or be the first to strike. Uh, this is an issue that Israel has been dealing with, whether it's Iran or Iraq, directly. And we have always stood by them, and we should continue that. Um, but we should let them as a sovereign state, independent, decide what and when they need to do what they need to do. In foreign relations, we would discuss. Um, and then after a declaration of war, Congress would make the decision as to what would need to be done next. At no point would the President or United Nations or NATO decide that for us. Um, as far as sanctions being applied, Looking at the issues, um, it is something that I would have to look at, Congress would have to look at, and we would have to understand deeply to know what steps we need to take. It's very easy to watch the news and think that we can come up as uh, backseat drivers to say, this is what I would do. Let's j just get in there and want to immediately fight. At the end of the day, folks, if we send people in there it is our young men and young women who would have to go in there on our behalf. And so we need to make sure that we always look at everything and analyze before that declaration is made. Uh, 
Uh, that is an issue I'm very concerned about because, first of all, we should never be eager to go to war. It is the most ugliest, ugliest thing in, in, in humankind. So we must first try to, as a nation, always try to avert war at all cost. That's the first thing. We must try to avert and use diplomacy. So I would first definitely, um, if I were in Congress, I would definitely look at that very, very carefully. We are committed to Israel, and, and there is commitment. But the reality also is, if Israel goes in and attacks, we're going in. But can this country sustain it? Can we afford it? Our manpower, our weaponry system is exhausted. Our budget is busted. You know, where is that going to leave the United States? So that concerns me greatly. And I do believe that the president is trying to avert that type of war at all cost. And that is, that is where I would stand, is to try to avert any type of military action, use the diplomacy, use the sanctions, whatever needs to be done to avert war at all cost. And if that fails and Iran becomes a serious threat and actually strikes, then we've got to hit them back with everything we've got. Thank you very much. You ask any military commander, and they always say, try diplomacy, try diplomacy, try diplomacy. The last thing they want to do is carry out their mission, which is to use arms to defend our national interests. Having said that, though, we do have a country, Iran, that has a history of being, quite frankly, our enemy. And when our enemy shows by their actions that they could potentially destabilize the region by their conduct, then we have to be extremely alert and we have to be ready to act with our ally, which is Israel. A few days ago, Washington Post reported that Iranian agents were seen in Syria helping the Syrian gov government maintain its um, its, its, its uh, power or, or its, or its uh, actions against groups that want to promote democracy in Syria. The U.S. cannot take lightly Iran's capability to develop its armaments, nuclear specifically. We still depend on oil as much as we don't want to believe it or say it, but we are dependent on oil from the Middle East. And if Iran's actions lead to more instability in that region, then it will affect our ability to maintain our economy. It will, it, will, it will compromise our ability to maintain world commerce, and it's something we cannot allow. So as a congressman, I would feel obliged to support our commander-in-chief, having known all the intelligence that would be provided to us, but I would lean towards supporting the commander-in-chief in taking decisive action before Iran becomes even more powerful in that region. As an 18-year-old, I joined the United States Marine Corps. I did it because my uncle had served two tours in Vietnam as a Marine Corps recon ranger. I didn't listen to my dad, who had served one tour in Vietnam as a combat medic. As a 45-year-old father of two, I've got an 11-year-old little boy who likes to play soldier. I do not want to send young men into battle to die for our country unless it's absolutely necessary, nor would I vote to do so unless it was absolutely necessary. That being said, if you can't support a friend, who's going to support you? And that's it. We have a long-term relationship with Israel. There is a, a bond. We helped establish it as a sovereign nation. And to allow it to be destroyed by a power that is openly adverse to us is intolerable. Thank you. First, I'd like to start by saying I support Israel 100%. Iran cannot be trusted with a nuclear device, with any kind of nuclear weapon, any nuclear arsenal. They can't be trusted with conventional forces. 
I think when the president is pushing for more sanctions on Iran to get out of them what he wants, which is obedience to the international community, he should be supported. I support him 100% in that. Iran has shown that they're an enemy of the United States and they're an enemy of Israel and they needed to be treated as much. But what I do like what the president is doing, what I, what I trust him to do and what he's shown he's gonna do in the past, what he's done in the past is that he relies on diplomacy, not like our last president that went straight to the weapons. He relies on diplomacy and he relies on sanctions and the international community, he builds coalitions. I think what he's doing now with Iran and his policy with Iran is a shining perfect example for future leaders, congressmen, senators, presidents of how to handle a very tense, potentially lethal situation. I support him with the sanctions, I support Israel, and I do not support Iran having a nuclear weapon and that must be, they must be stopped to have having one at all cost. This is very simple. Israel is our friend, Iran is our enemy. Sanctions have not worked. We've tried diplomacy and we keep trying. We keep giving them chances. If Israel is attacked, it is our duty and our responsibility to defend them. They are our friends and Iran cannot be trusted. Thank you. The question was if uh, Iran poses a direct danger to the United States, and I, I think it does. I really think it does. This is very important to me. I think as a congressman, you would uh, expect us to make sure we make an informed decision when it comes to taking any military action. I would not support any kind of military action where there is no justifiable evidence for us to go to war. I believe that we should, before we even put our weapons and put our young men and women in harm's way, we need to make sure that we have the evidence that we need, we have our men and women, our protection of our country first in hand because Israel is our friend, and I agree with every one of you. We need to protect them. If they are attacked, we need to be prepared. But at the same time, I could not support going to war without first exhausting all diplomacy, sanctions that are fully necessary for us to be able to make sure that we maintain our relationship with Israel and we support Israel. And as your congressman, I will work hard to make sure that I will be fully prepared and fully informed before we send our men and women for military action. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna <clears throat> move on to a different issue and I'm gonna start with um, Denise Sands Blankshire. Uh, this, this next, the next issue basically requires leadership. We have plenty of managers or people who want to manage and control in, in Washington. And we are experiencing uh, what people call a leadership vacuum. Now, this is the healthcare issue. We all know that we have here in South Texas and among other parts of Texas, an obesity problem, right? Among other types of problems. <laughs> it's a problem, we have to acknowledge it. Now, the question is, how would we deal with the issue of preventive care within the debate of you know, health care reform uh, that is also connected to health literacy? Yes. How would you deal with this particular issue? Oh. What type of leadership will you use to try to tackle that was just one particular health problem that I mentioned. Sure. To talk about the, whether or not preventive care is something important to promote. Absolutely. Along with that, with health literacy, which is something that's forgotten. Oh, a absolutely. Um, health care um, you know, is very important. And um, I am, you know, a, I'm pro-life. And uh, that means the life, every life is important to me. Every life. And that's why health care was important. And in, in, in regards to that, that's why the obesity issue 
and the ability to have access to health care, the, uh, the ability to have access to wellness programs, the ability to have access to information is very, very important. And I believe that's what the, the Health Care Reform Act included, and that was part of it, that with a very basic health care insurance plan that was, that's going to be available for everyone at a very low cost, that was the direction of that. That was the purpose, so that people could have an opportunity to have a wellness program, have preventive uh, medical care before it got so, before it would become so serious. We know that obesity is tied to the heart disease, the diabetes, and the list of diseases go on. So that is extremely important, and particularly in South Texas, and then especially with the Hispanic community, we have a serious issue with diabetes and also the overweight children. There was a study done just at Porter High School using our, our schools, and I think it was like 50, 60 percent of the children in high school are obese in Brownsville, Texas alone. And what that means is by the time these children Okay, it becomes an economic and a job issue because by the time these children reach 30, 40 years old, they're going to have serious health care issues. They're not going to be able to possibly hold a job because of the illnesses. They're not going to be productive. They're not going to be paying taxes. In fact, they're going to probably need some sort of medical care. And if they're not working, it is going to be the government that's going to, help to have to help subsidize. So it is extremely important that we make that investment in the health care issue, in prevention, and also education on health care initiatives. Thank you very much, and I would support them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Solomon Torres. One of the big flaws in our delivery of health care is just that, health illiteracy. In fact, people who have access to insurance now and are fortunate to have health insurance now, don't themselves exercise proper use of health insurance to take advantage of the preventive care features of insurance. So imagine those 40% plus of our population in this area that have no access to health care. How can you expect them to be on top of, um, on top of this issue the way people with health insurance do? The answer lies on several fronts. Number one, we actually need to expand the amount of nutrition research here in our region and in the state. My wife, who works at the Regional Academic Health Center, is coordinating several studies that focus on nutrition research. Some focus on Hispanics. So it, it, it is that fundamental. People who have access to, uh, to, to, um, to different foods, simply do not exercise proper judgment because they don't understand the science of the food that, that they're consuming. We take for granted that we can eat a flour tortilla because we grew up eating a flour tortilla, but it's one of the most unhealthy things you can put in your body. And we do it as if there's nothing wrong with it. Well, there's nothing wrong with eating a flour tortilla, but there's a lot wrong with eating it in excess and not eating a well-balanced meal or, or diet and not being part of a well-balanced lifestyle. That, that is all related back to education. It's related back to what kind of influence we have on our children. How hard do we push our children to be littered when it comes to their bodies, when it comes to their nutrition needs. Also, recruitment of medical professionals. We sorely need more medical personnel in the Valley, doctors and nurses. Okay, thank you. Anthony. Thank you. Um, diabetes and preventive medicine are huge issues. Health choices are huge issues. In the city of Brownsville, we started the Brownsville's Biggest Loser program. The reason for that was a joint project with the University of Texas Health Science Centers from Houston. They came down and they did studies and wanted to study diabetes and obesity in our community. The reason for that is because we are a microcosm of many of the problems that the state of Texas and the nation are going to face over the coming years based on our population, the education levels, and what the studies show is that healthy choices, healthy attitudes, and habits are connected with prosperity. 
and economic development. The higher your income level, the more likely you are to make good choices for food, good choices for uh, your family as far as exercise, and you've got a higher quality of life. We have to promote two things, education and involvement, which is similar to what the city is doing through the Brownsville Biggest Loser program. You can participate in activities throughout the city. And also, we have to do things that are going to increase the ability to generate income so that people actually have time to go out and take advantage of that. If all you're doing day in and day out is trying to get food on the table and money to pay your gas and electricity, you're not going to have time to take a walk and enjoy the park and everything else. So you have to focus on both aspects. It has to be a dual program. One is focusing on choices for healthy attitudes and habits. And the other thing is the community and the community leaders are trying to improve opportunities. And with that, you can have a better community. And it's not just for Brownsville, it's for the entire area. Because this problem, the obesity problem, is a national problem. Because we have too many kids that are sitting in front of the TV instead of getting out and getting involved. Thank you. Hey, thank you. One way you can help cut into the obesity problem in the, in the Rio Grande Valley or in the United States is through education. We need to create an education policy, a national education policy, and a local education policy that emphasizes good choices, healthy li a healthy lifestyle, and activity. Activity and eating right is what, how you control your health and how you maintain your health. In San Antonio, the mayor of San Antonio, Julian Castro, is a perfect example of somebody offering leadership and trying to help keep his community healthy. He lives by it. He participates in activities, physical activities around his community, around his city. He eats properly. He goes out and he speaks on it. He leads from the front. He's a proactive leader on the issue of keeping the people. In San Antonio, there's a lot of minorities. I was one of them. I'm from San Antonio. And health is a big issue. I have met family members that are obese. And they, it's not obese, they have joint problems now because of it. They have heart problems because of it. They have all other sorts of issues that come with it. And to address the part with the preventive health care, when it comes to preventive health care, I understand that the new um, health policy that the state of Texas has adopted addresses that. So we need to support that and let people know about that so they'll know how to maintain their own health, maintain it and prevent health problems. Another thing you can do is elect a congressman that is physically fit, that will lead by example and show our children how to, act, to participate in, in health activities and eat healthy and make proper choices and be proactive in that way and send out information and, and, and let the people know about the proper choices they can make and what can happen on the negative side if they don't make these choices, not to scare them, but just to inform them. You know, the health issue is not just a health issue. It's an economics issue. And I know, because I have a son that's a diabetic, and he's been a diabetic since he was 20 years old. I'm so proud to say he has dedicated his life to educating people on obesity and diabetes. We lose so many productive citizens to health-related uh, issues, losing of limbs, losing kidneys. This is an economic issue. It's very expensive. And how do we fix that? We need faith-based programs that can help us. This is a big problem. This is an education program. And if somebody would just be a leader and I think I can be that leader. I have been in the health business for a long, long time. We own a pharmacy here for over 20 years, and we've seen the ramifications of obesity and diabetes. We cannot mandate anybody to follow a program, but we can educate them, and we can help them. We need people that understand the program, the problem, and not just 
talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Ramiro Garza. Thank you. I agree. This, this um, health care is actually an epidemic in the obesity section. My wife is a registered dietitian, and I've learned a thing or two from her. You know, it's not just about diet and exercise. It's an entire lifestyle change. And I lived through that myself. You know, my family, I come from a family that uh, runs deep in diabetes. Um, uh, I lost my father to diabetes at the age of 46, all his brothers, his sister. Uh, I have an entire family tree, uh, branch that I've lost to diabetes. So I understand it. And in most of those cases, uh, they were born with it. They had genes in it. But there's the type 2 also that I think in this area, we, if we take care of ourselves, we probably won't get there. And that's myself. It's one thing that I've been working on personally myself. But education is the key. I think that um, when I was city manager, one thing that I did is I instituted a wellness program. And instead of uh, you know, providing uh, the employees with uh, an actual uh, uh, physical that they would do every year, what we did is we incentivized it and we uh, actually provided them actually money in their paycheck if they actually went to get a physical in the list of the different types of parental care that one would need to be able to make sure that you are uh, as healthy as you can be. And what we saw is that our, our visits to our local uh, doctors, our medical facilities, our employees decrease, the costs reduced. So folks, this does work. And I believe we need to do it effectively. We need to do it in a way that we collaborate with community organizations and school groups and businesses to be able to make sure that we coordinate these efforts and make sure we educate not just our children, but everyone uh, in our district. And I would support wholeheartedly any efforts that we could highlight the importance of this issue that I think is uh, very, can become very problematic in the future. Thank you. It's not, oh, there it is. Um, the issue of diabetes, uh, overweight, an overweight population, is certainly a national issue. Um, the, the line that I'm going to draw, however, is that at what point do we uh, look at our health issues and allow the federal government to, because of them, control what we put in our mouths or how much exercise we are now uh, mandated to perform, a calorie intake, etc. Do I believe that we need to educate the community, not only about nutrition, but exercise? Absolutely. I think that what the city of Brownsville is doing in regards to making the city a more outdoor, uh, physical city is great. We need to have those programs at the city level. As a congresswoman, I would absolutely work with the localities within the district uh, to help in facilitate that process, to make the communities more outdoorsy and, and more friendly to children with parks and, and uh, trails, uh, bike lanes, all of that. But as a congresswoman, I would never allow the federal government to dictate what anyone puts in their mouth. Um, I do believe, however, that the one step that the federal government can take is to be um, an educator through public service announcements. We've had them before. We educated, 20, 30 years ago, we educated the, the public on, the, on AIDS and how it, it wasn't spread through handshaking or sneezing. We've educated people on washing their hands or you know, covering their mouths when they cough. The, government, the federal government can institute a program like that to let people know, hey, you know, good exercise, a certain amount of calorie intake. We have the nutrition labels that are required in, in, in food packaging. So that's about as far as I would go. At every other level, we need to let the communities take care of themselves. We need to p educate parents so that then they can decide what they need to do for their children. And, and it goes on from there. But um, I, I don't believe that it's the federal government's business to dictate. Thank you for that. In an interest to make sure that the folks in the audience get a chance to meet the candidates afterwards, we're going to go ahead and move right to the closing statements. You'll have two minutes for that. 
and I encourage you to address any topics that you think voters would have liked to have heard an answer on. This is your opportunity to put that in there. We're going to start with Anthony. Your two minutes begins as soon as you start to talk. If I can get up here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's very important that we engage in this process. It has been over 20 years since we've had an open seat. Uh, the last forum it was commented on that there has never been a congressman from Brownsville. In fact, there has been. It was back in the 1930s. I know that because I purchased his home where I have my law office, and I re rebuilt that home. Uh, we are in a position where the person who is elected as our next congressman for District 34 is going to affect the face of our community over the next 10 to 15 years. Where we go into the future is going to be a big part of the funds and projects that are brought to our community. We have a lot of potential. We need to make that a reality because we don't want to live in the past or in the, in the world of what ifs and should have beens and could have beens. We want to be proactive and accomplish the goals that we set out for our community and for our children. Because of that, I sincerely and humbly ask for your vote, I ask for your support of you and your families so that we can make our dreams of a brighter community all throughout District 34 a reality. Thank you. Brownsville is a very historical city. In fact, the destiny of two nations was pretty much established in 1846 when U.S. and Mexico fought here, just miles away from us. History is a great lesson for us. And you know that if you do not elect a congressman from your county, it will make a difference in the long run. Brownsville, we may not face this opportunity, and Cameron County may not face this opportunity for years or decades to select somebody from here, somebody who will have the best interests of South Texas up in Washington. That is why I ask you, as Brownsville residents and as residents of other parts of District 34, to take this decision very, very seriously as to whom you select on May 29th. The individual you select should be the best qualified, should be the one with the most relevant experience, should be the one that can start to work on day one, not year number two after they get elected. That's what I'm offering you. I'm offering you that if you elect me as your next congressman, I will start from day one to work on aggressively for the needs of the Rio Grande Valley and South Texas. Expect the highest standards of all your candidates. Expect the highest standards of me, candidates who are here, candidates who are not here. If there's blemishes of any candidate on this slate, you should talk about it. We should talk about it because this is about one of the highest offices in our U.S. government. So if there are candidates who are here or candidates who are not here that have questionable actions in the past, where public trust was compromised, then that should be discussed by you as voters. And I welcome that type of discussion as well as getting to know all of you. Thank you and God bless you. Thank, thank you so much. And again, I want to thank Cheeseman, Dr. Figueroa, and Brian for being here and giving us this opportunity. This truly is democracy in action. But I'm going to ask you for your support. It's very, very simple. I want to go work for you. I've been doing it all my life as a public servant. I want to bring service back into the word public servant. It's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. And I have dedicated my life from working from the, to the Brownsville Independent School District to working with the Brownsville Chamber of Commerce, the, the Brownsville Economic Development Council, the Brownsville Airport, and 20 years of government service serving in the House of Representatives with, with our former congressman. I have worked every issue in this district, from the north to the south. I am, I am ready to continue. You know, I thought I was just actually going to go into retirement, start my own business, because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. 
but I realize that there are so many unmet needs in our community. We need people that, we, we need to have our people be represented in Washington, to have a loud and clear voice on the issues that are important to us, from creating jobs, economic opportunities, better educational opportunities for our kids, protecting our social security, helping to you know, work on our deficit, because that's important, and fighting like heck for our veterans. And so I ask you to please support me in my bid for Congress, because I don't owe anybody anything, but I owe you everything. And I will work, continue to work very hard to give you everything I have to be your voice. Because when you go to Washington, it's not whether you're an R or D, it's about you, the people. And I wanna be your representative and your voice and you'll be able to count on me, and not just in words, but in actions. I've been doing it all my life and I wanna continue on your behalf to be your voice and your representative in Washington, D.C. Please let's make history by sending me to Congress so I can be the first Latina from Texas to go to Congress. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks, Denise. I can be the first Latina too. <laughs> Thank you uh, to Chief Smith for setting up uh, the, this program. Thank you for all who took the time to be here. I know it's very late. Thank you for everyone who participated. Um, if you want something different, if you don't want a career politician, if you see that the problems we face today are bigger than just Brownsville, because they are. Brownsville has issues. Uh, we want jobs, we want an economy in Brownsville. But the fact of the matter is that our problems are bigger than just Brownsville. Our problems span the county, they span the district, the state, and the nation. And if we stand here and say, I want, 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 and what is that person on that stage? Who is going to bring more to my city? Then you're, you're missing the picture. Because at some point, all of these freebies or the wants, wants, wants will end. And at that point, we won't have Brownsville, we won't have a Cameron County, and we won't have a country. So what we need to do is, and, and I know it's a small crowd now, but you need to look within yourselves and say, what is bigger? What can I give my community can I look past the tradition of voting always Democrat? Can I look at someone who is a quote unquote Republican, but who, hey, is Latina, habla Espanol, nació en Mexico, and still wants to represent me? Because that's what I am. I am a person who is just like anyone here in Brownsville. I have lived and I have worked hard to achieve my American dream. And I know that in this community, there are many people who want that opportunity, many, many young adults who want that opportunity as well. And that is what I want to provide. The opportunity, not just today with a freebie, but to go to Washington, represent you, and say enough of the spending, enough of the bloated government, because when you do that, you are limiting the opportunities for the people in Brownsville, Harlingen, San Benito, Kingsville, Alice, DeWitt, it doesn't matter. And so if you want something different, you want something bigger and, and better than what we can just provide here, then I am your candidate for US Congress. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and uh, thank you again, Browns and Cheeseman, the panel, for uh, hosting us today. This is a great opportunity to get to know us candidates. You know, there's no justifiable evidence that an anti-government strategy has worked. This us versus them, it's about uh, all of us working together. You know, I grew up believing in public service. When done right, can do good things in people's lives. I believe the role of government should be that of People, working with people in the community and businesses to create opportunities to help people get to where they need to in life. Better schools, better universities, a strong healthcare system, and a secure social safety net. I believe that, you know, the question should be actually, uh, are we doing, how are we doing to uh, help our economy? I don't think we're doing enough. I think that the issue in this campaign is about who is in the candidates has the experience and the ability to not just go out and fight in Washington, but who can go up to Washington and build consensus, build alliances, so that we can create opportunities for our district. You know, I'm not satisfied that a thir three times the national average of poverty exists here, right here in this county. Three times the national average, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not satisfied that our classrooms are crowded. I'm not satisfied that we're still 
a growing population with about a million people without an interstate highway. These are all factors that strengthen the local economy. And I have the experience working the last 15 years creating new jobs, creating opportunities for residents all throughout this area. And I want to use that experience to work for you as your congressman. Because as a congressman, we don't file a bill to create jobs, but what we can do is we can create an environment that cultivates new opportunities to bring more jobs to this area, expand transportation, broaden access to higher education, while preserving Medicare and Social Security. That's what I would do as your congressman, and I will fight hard to make sure that you are represented in the best way possible in D.C. Thank you so much. Thank you. I agree with Mr. Torres. It starts with honesty. You tell your people what you're about. I've lived in this community for 36 years, and I am a small businesswoman. I know what our country is going through. I've, seen, I've signed the front of a paycheck. I've had to look at employees in the eye and tell them, you're a great employee, you've been with me for 20 years, and I have to let you go. I know what it is to fight, to check your bank, to see if you can make payroll. Our Constitution was written to limit the power of government, and we have deviated so much from it. We need to bring it back to we, the people. It is in your hands to find somebody that will represent you in Washington. You will not have another opportunity like this one for a long, long time. Choose well. Choose somebody that has worked for you. A career politician is somebody that gets paid for a job. I've served my community and I've never been paid for any service. I appreciate your support. I thank you for this forum and I ask for your vote. Thank you. First, I'd like to start by thanking, again, Brownsville Chisme and the moderators here tonight for coming here and moderating this event and hosting this event. Brownsville Chisme, thank you very much. And it was an honor and a privilege for uh, being able to speak with you tonight and come before you and explain some of my uh, ideas and platforms. If you look at the candidates that we have here tonight, with the exception of me, we've all had an opportunity to serve our country and our communities here, here locally. This is what you've gotten from them, either on individual resumes or all together. 13.6% unemployment just here in Cameron County. 34% of the population living below the poverty line. No telling how many more are hovering around that, living on the margins. A 48% high school dropout rate. That's what you have. That's what you can expect from them, more of it. We need to elect a new leader to send us in a new direction with new ideas. Elect somebody that's going to not just say what needs to be done and have ideas and line them up and itemize them and tell you what's, what's going good and what's going bad, but you need to elect somebody that's going to take action. That's very important, that's going to take action against the corruption that's gone wild, against the waste in government, against the, the problems that we have with the divisive government. Somebody that's going to go up there and cooperate and work with others, not go up there and to create gridlock in Washington, D.C. That's very important that you, you elect someone like that. It's very important that you elect someone that's going to take action. I am that candidate, and I'm humbled tonight to be here to talk with you. I ask you humbly for your votes and your support. Thank you. We certainly want to thank the candidates again. Let's give them another round of applause. On behalf of Brownsville Chisme, UTB, Action 4 News, we thank you for being a fantastic audience. We encourage you to find us on our Facebook pages, Brownsville Chisme, UTB, search Ryan Wolf. Talk to everybody about what you learned tonight, and more importantly, get out there and vote. Have a great night.